Thank you, please. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks, dear friend. And I, too, want to thank Governor Andrus, Dave Adler, and the entire team and our university, Boise State University, for hosting this fabulous conference. I have had a ball. I'm really exhausted. Um, and my mind has just been expanded tremendously, and it's going to keep going. So thanks, thanks so much. Really appreciate it. We are here during this session to talk about women and risk. And we are going to, just like Ann did, and thank you, Ann, so much for opening that last conversation up. That was terrific. So I'm going to talk for a few minutes. We're going to do that again. And this time, I hope we can actually, instead of having people walk up to have to stand at the microphone, I'm hoping we can get the microphones to you to make it even more, com more conversational. But I'd like to uh, tell a couple stories, and I'd like to start by asking three questions. Should we be encouraging women and girls to take risks? What kind of risks should those be? And how do we do it? Risk is a part of life, and life is deep in risk. There's hardly a moment in our lives where we don't have some kind of risk. But it, that is not always a bad thing. As a teacher, I have seen that the moments in which our students learn best are often those moments that involve risk the risk of venturing an opinion, the risk of asking questions, especially in front of others, the risk of making mistakes in front of others, the risk of challenging an established idea, the risk of failure, and I think the biggest risk of all is the risk of never learning this, that in order to learn, we must take risks. So when we talk about risk, we can say that there are physical risks, and I think you know what I mean, like life and limb, there are psychological risks, such as fear and trauma. And then, I think an even bigger risk, and the one that's probably the most important, are the social, societal aspects of risk. What taking risks means to our society as a whole. And so, I'd like to get the conversation started today, about, with, first with a story about physical risk, by taking all of us into space, and putting us all at physical risk at least in our minds. So imagine you're an astronaut. You're with my crewmates and me six years ago last month when we launched on our space shuttle Endeavour to the International Space Station. After years, and I mean years, of training, you suit up, you climb aboard the Astro Van, you're driven out to Launch Pad 39A at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. You take a very long, long elevator ride up the launch tower to the 195th foot level above the ground, and that's about 19 stories high. And then you walk across a very narrow, 65 foot long, movable orbiter access arm that spans the gap between the launch tower and your space shuttle's entry hatch that's up, way up near the nose of the shuttle. Basically, you're walking across an open-air catwalk. And this is probably a very good time for me to tell you something that you might not know. Some astronauts, including some of our military jet pilots, have a fear of heights. <laughs> Next, your technicians will help you put on your escape parachute uh, harness and your launch helmet, and then you'll crawl through the space shuttle's hatch on your, on your hands and knees and then the technicians will strap you into your launch seat. They'll strap you in, they'll wish you well, and they will tell you they've made everything as safe as possible. And then they will exit the orbiter, they'll close the hatch, and they will go three and a half miles away for their own safety. <laughs> <laughs> and that is because if we have an accident on the launch pad, it would be an enormous explosion. So here we are in your enormous spaceship. It's big enough to hold a school bus in its payload bay on the back end. It weighs, with its boosters, over four and a half million pounds. And at launch, it will produce seven and a half million pounds of thrust. And thrust, by what I mean by that, is seven and a half million pounds of power, not of weight. While you are strapped in, lying on your backs, inside it is totally surround to sound because the shuttle's big orange tank that you see strapped to the side 
is filled with liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen at hundreds of degrees below zero. And so the whole enormous spaceship is creaking and moaning and groaning, and you really feel like you're in a live bird. You lie in wait. You and I are alone with our crewmates. None of us is afraid. We are not afraid. We are certainly alert. And we are ready, <laughs> because we decided years ago that this risk was worth it. So it's worth it for many different reasons. Some will say it's for adventure and experience, simply and purely. All will say it's for our country, and also to explore, to learn, to discover. And one of my favorite reasons is for our children to see that adults learn too, and that we humans reach, and that we reach in order to learn. And so you are ready, I mean really ready. You're ready to launch, right? Okay. <laughs> you are there on the launch pad, alert with happy hearts. The three main engines start, and then the huge solid rocket boosters light off, and you are literally leaping off the launch pad. By the time you clear the launch tower, you're already going 100 miles an hour. You are going straight up, rolling over as you go, and it's roaring, rumbling, thundering rush as you accelerate to 17,500 miles an hour. So that's a big number. <laughs> no math in public, but it's five miles a second. So for those of you who know you are here at Boise State, and if you want to get to the mall, it will take you exactly one second. Okay? If you want to go up to McCall, Idaho, it will take you 20 seconds. The G-forces press you back in your seats. Some of your uh, colleagues, some of the veteran astronauts, will have told you before you launched that it feels like a two-ton gorilla jumping up and down on your chest. But to us, and certainly to me, that didn't feel like that at all. But what we feel is just this huge, powerful thrust. You feel the biggest push you've ever felt on your back. And it feels like the orbiter could actually push right through you and leave you behind. But it doesn't. And then, in just eight and a half minutes, you reach orbit, the engines shut off, and quite suddenly, you are in space and you are weightless. And this, the weightlessness is kind of strange and it's very cool. Um, how many of you have flown in your dreams? All right, then you know what it's like to be weightless, okay? For those of you that haven't flown in your dreams, but maybe you're really comfortable in a swimming pool and you've been able to hang in a dead man's float, okay? Or try it in your bathtub next time. <laughs> okay. It's kind of like that. It's the same sensation except when you're in the swimming pool or in the bathtub really relaxed, all of your cells are being pulled back down, pulled back down to earth and it's that water that's holding you up, that's giving you that buoyancy. In space, you don't have that. Every single cell in your body is weightless. So you are hanging there, you are a satellite, and your crewmates are satellites inside the space shuttle that's a satellite, or the space station that's a satellite, orbiting the Earth. And it's an amazing sensation. So here we are, suddenly weightless, and guess what we get to do? We have to go to work right away. It is actually really marvelous, it's great work, and it truly is out of this world, and we adapt to the weightlessness. So, we're in space and everything is going really well, isn't it? It's all strange, it's terrific, and the big risk is over, right? Wrong. Wrong. Here comes more risk. Too soon, while we're working, we get a call from Mission Control. Our Capcom informs us that during launch, a chunk of foam broke off the big orange tank, the fuel tank, and it gouged a hole in the protective surface of our space shuttle. And this is the exact same thing that had happened four years earlier to the Columbia Space Shuttle, which caused its, its destruction as it was returning to Earth. So what do we do? Well, this is what we did. On our actual mission, on board the Space Shuttle Endeavor six years ago, Mission Control told us about the problem, and then they told us to go on about our business building the International Space Station, while the engineers back on Earth would study the problem and they would get back to us later. And that's exactly what we did. So let's all of us do now what our crew did when we got that call. Just hold that thought and we'll go on with our business. 
So our conversation today is about women and risk, and I just gave you an example of physical risk. And the reason I did that is because our risk on the shuttle was equal for our entire crew, both male and female alike. I wanted to look at physical risk first, mainly because it's the simplest risk to talk about, I think. Women die just as easily as men die. We are just as mortal. But it is only recently that women have been allowed into physically dangerous jobs, such as combat, police work, firefighting, and space flight. Women are still relatively rare compared to men in these positions. But physically, there is no difference. The risk is the same. So then, what about women's psychological response to physical danger? Are we women more psychologically vulnerable? Do we frighten more easily? And what about society and risk? Does society need a special class, an entire gender, that are risk specialists that take on physical risks while the others do not? Is that a job just for the other gender? Well, for the psychological differences, I can tell you again that I see none. I have had five very dear friends, women friends, who have lost their lives in space and in aviation accidents. Teacher in space Krista McAuliffe and a astronaut Judy Resnick perished on board the Space Shuttle Challenger shortly after liftoff when its external fuel tank exploded. My astronaut classmate, Patty Robertson, lost her life in an experimental aircraft which stalled and crashed when she was teaching somebody else. Astronauts Laurel Clark and Kalpana Chawla died when the space shuttle Columbia was attempting to re-enter the atmosphere and super hot gases burned through a hole in the wing's leading edge that had been gouged by a piece of that falling foam when they had launched 16 days prior. I know that they were as brave, as cool, calm, and collected as their male crewmates were, and I know that because I knew them very well. And I, know that because, and I know that because I've been a member of a space shuttle crew launching into space and coming back through the heat of re-entry after being told we had a hole in our heat shield. And the women crew members were just as calm, cool, and collected as the rest of our crew. We did land just fine. We were lucky. So we might have questions today in our conversation about women and courage. Here's what I know. Women are brave. You are brave. But here's a question. Are women brave but for different reasons? Is there something different about our kind of courage? I want to bring this all back to my partner up, who will be up here today, Ann Fleming. Thanks, Ann. Why don't you come on up, OK? And the rest of us here, by first mentioning something that I've noticed again and again in my career as an elementary school teacher, and it is this. For whatever reasons, young boys take far more risks than young girls do. And it's not just out on the jungle gym in the schoolyard. It's in the classroom, too, whether it is by venturing an opinion or by taking a guess or by imagining wild ideas I mean, and I say this in all lovingness, who are usually the goofballs in the third grade classroom? Girls or boys? Risking being wrong in front of other people seems to come easier or more naturally for the boys. Watch them. Boys can be wrong, wrong, and wrong again and again, and it's okay. And some quiet little girls are often right, but the boys are the ones who are taking the risks. So I wonder, how do we encourage girls to take more risks? And what kinds of risks? What works for girls and for women? What is it about us? And how do we use that to good effect? So I've asked some big and fuzzy and difficult questions. And luckily, my partner here today, thank you, Anne, is the best person I know to make some sense out of all of this and to lead us in a conversation. So thank you, Anne, for being up here. And thank you all very much. We're about to, oh, is that working? Yes. Oh, good, okay. Is it working here? Good. Okay, so here's the first question. 
why am I such a physical chicken and I don't like it? I, you, you're, even you're describing that, I'm listening to you describe the shuttle thing, yeah. and my little stomach's going, huh, huh. <laughs> and I think, could you have taken me at a certain point and instill, I mean, I think I'm risky in other ways, but the physical risky part is, would be daunting to me. I think, I, I think we could have, and I think we can now. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I guess I want you to know, when Krista and I, um, the first time we were down at, at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, and we were up above that 195-foot level, we were way up at the top of the orbiter, um, basically you're standing on, uh, it almost looks like chicken wire, right? And, um, stronger than that, <laughs> but that's basically what you're standing on, with, with a little bit of railing here and there, and it was very, very windy. And I had not told anybody, but I too was very afraid of heights. And here you are looking down, you try not to look down, but you can't help yourself, you're looking down, straight down through chicken wire, strong chicken wire, and really windy, and I felt that I had this death grip and I remembered, you know, when I used to be nervous playing my flute, the worst thing you could do is tighten up. You just had to relax. So I kind of thought about that, and I thought, you know what? This is a really stupid time to be afraid of heights. <laughs> and so I had to work my way through it and, and talk my way out of it. You know, it didn't, it made it easier. It didn't just automatically go away. But it also reminds me of when I was a little girl. I was a swimmer. I, I ended up being a swimmer, not like Karen. I wish I had, had that kind of talent. But when I was very little, I remember, and I don't know why this is such a strong memory, but I think it's because it was so fearful, but I used to be very afraid of the drain. And I thought for sure that the drain was gonna suck you down with it. And I remember my parents trying to talk me through it and say, don't be, you know, don't be silly, nothing's gonna happen. Look at all the other people. And I just couldn't fathom that. But finally, and I don't know why I did this, but I had my little, you know, those big orange puppy uh, uh, floater, floaters Floaties, that we used yeah. to wear. Um, I remember saying, okay, I'm going to try this, and I got in the pool, I hung to the edge, but it was near the deep end with, with that drain there, and I took one lap, like dog paddling, and saying, hi drain, hi drain, hi drain, <laughs> and I did that back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, so I, I think we can do that, but I think back to the, the whole... Uh, with the orbiter and everything, because I have been asked is how do you, how, after you see not just one terrible accident where you yeah. lose seven dear friends, but two terrible accidents and you lose seven dear friends, you know, how do you go forward that, with that? And for me, I think, Anne, you really stated it when you said, and I don't remember which number it was, but <laughs> to have a passion mm -hmm. and have something that you're, that you're very engaged in that's way outside of yourself. And when I first started with the Teacher in Space program, I thought this is a fantastic thing for our students in our mm -hmm. classroom. I didn't understand the much bigger picture that Krista McAuliffe understood. She mm -hmm. understood what this was gonna do nationally for teachers and for our education system. Mm -hmm. I was thinking mm -hmm. much narrower. And then with the accident and everything else that happened and having Krista as my mentor, mm -hmm. um, I just realized that this was a much bigger thing and mm -hmm. it's something that I made a commitment to and, and then you start, you know, you, you weigh the risks, and, and to me, there was nothing more important than showing our kids that we will keep the future open for them, mm -hmm. we will keep going. And so then you, like I kind of said, you, you, you go forward with a happy heart. You work hard, you do the best you can mm -hmm. to um, minimize the risks, and do your part, and trust in everybody else. We're gonna, there, there are microphones which are gonna be anybody who wants to get in the conversation. I think there are hand mics here that can be, you don't have to come up, so if you just raise your hand and get in, because Barbara would love the same sort of conversation. Let in me fact, add, you're being very quiet, way too quiet. I know. <laughs> um, what, do, what do we do with girls in a classroom? This is the ongoing question. Do you think, it suddenly occurs to me listening to you, Maybe we do more physical risky stuff with, ki with girl kids. Maybe that's a way for them to get their psychological riskiness kicked in. Because, you know, it is an, it is an ongoing dilemma that, you know, boys just jump in there. Yeah. They jump in there. Yeah. So it, it, does that make sense? That does make sense, and I love that idea. And I hadn't given that a whole lot of thought, but I really like that idea. And I would love to hear other ideas that you all have. 
I, I think that's really, really important. Somebody yesterday said something about getting our girls in sports. Yeah. Um, for, for team reasons, and right. there's nothing more valuable than, than learning how to work really well on a team. But I do think that also puts you in that more physical, uh, physical environment, which is really good. Also, starting earlier, I'm thinking because the first thing that happens to little girls is you're not supposed to get your dress dirty, or you're yeah. not supposed to yeah. fall down and yeah. skin your knees as if your knees were, you know, somehow more valuable. But I'm thinking at three, yeah. I think at three or four, I'm, I'm looking at you and I'm thinking, I love the courage that you represent. It, it knocks you me out. Too. You've got no, it too. It's no, too. It's too no. I mean the physical courage. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think if you had gotten a hold of me at like three and let me get messed up and hang from bars and knock a tooth out or something, I'd have been ready to go to space. If it makes or you, not. If it makes you feel better, my parents, who I dearly love, yeah. had me stop swimming at around fifth grade because my shoulders were getting too big and I didn't fit the dresses right. They couldn't find the right size dresses. <laughs> so I picked it up later again. but. Um, you know, something about courage that you mentioned, we talked yesterday about fear, and I think fear really can be debilitating. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that a different way of maybe looking at it is that courage is very contagious, and you can get it from the people around you, too. That's a really nice, yeah. Okay. Then something else to think about with little kids that I've, that I've noticed in the classroom, and I know teachers don't do this intentionally. I'm very guilty of it, too, and it's something I'm still working on. But oftentimes with girls, we'll say, oh, your, your work looks beautiful. Oh, what a great job. That looks so nice. Penmanship was always yep. big for girls. Really? Yep. And with the boys, those ones that are shouting out, shouting out the answers, we're constantly asking tougher questions of them. Well, why, do you, why do you think that? Mm -hmm. you know? And we're, we're forcing the boys mm -hmm. in a really good way mm -hmm. to think critically and be creative mm -hmm. in their thinking. Mm -hmm. And we don't do that to the mm -hmm. girls. And I think that's part of building in that mm -hmm. courage as well. How many of you here would even think about wanting to have gone into space? So a fair, right. <laughs> yeah. And, and would have, if you could have, that's a lot. That's good. Yeah, very good. You should. <laughs> And hopefully we'll get to the point where it's something that a, a lot of people could do without paying, e either becoming an astronaut or paying <laughs> you know, 20 million, 30 million dollars to take a ride. Okay, there's a question back here. Somebody's got a mic? I do. I have a question to follow up. Um, as an educator, let me give you a preface. I have a daughter who's 22 who last year went to Ecuador and took a trip up the Amazon to visit a shaman. So I know you understand that with your background from Quito. And this year, just got back from mapping volcanoes in Iceland. When she was in junior high, she, all the people who know me know, I describe her as my wild child. I mean, just a risk taker. <laughs> and I considered that to be a bad thing. I mean, just off the maps in terms of all the issues we had with raising a teenage girl in junior high who was that type of risk taker. So now it's more productive as an adult, but the, back then it was not fun. I have a son <laughs> who is a senior now in high school who, is doing the same kind of things. I mean, he rock climbs, so he's now rock climbing with I'm not sure what kind of protection. But we call him a goof. You know, I, um, a while ago I, he uh, put a whole bunch of uh, those metal balls on his teeth and swallowed them. I mean, risk taking, putting because he wanted to see if he could pull his braces off and then swallow them. So you know, but that's just goofy. So my question to you is that those are both risk taking behaviors and. And myself, as a mother, I saw one as difficult and not great and dangerous, and in my son, saw him always just boys being boys. So if you could talk about that in the junior high years, because I think that that's when girls really go off the cliff a lot of times is, you know, after that sixth grade year when they launch into junior high. And if you have any tips for parents on that. That's a tough one. That's a, that's a good it one. is a tough one. Um, you know, I think especially in junior high, and I think our younger women who are here who aren't, you know, I'm way, way far away from junior high, and maybe some of our younger women here can give us some insights on that. But um, there, is, there is such pressure to conform and to be like everybody else in junior high. And as we t talked about, if girls are constantly, from when they're little, being raised to be 
good, be prim, be proper. Um, not that that's a bad thing, but that, that discourages them from taking those kinds of risks that help them learn and help them grow, then it is harder at, at junior high. So I think, you know, somebody mentioned the labeling. I, I think that's something that can really help us if we can, as parents, as teachers, if, if we can just catch ourselves when we start doing those things and pause for a moment and ask, what do we want our kids to be when they're older? I had to learn the hard way. Clay and I have two boys, and I was the one that was constantly, you know, here's, you know, kind of directing them. And Clay finally said to me when they were in junior high, Barb, are you going to follow them through high school and college? <laughs> <laughs> At some point, you have to let them go and be who they're going to be. And I think he would have loved if we had started when they were, you know, when they were born. <laughs> It took me a while to learn that too. Do you, look, that do you look back and wish you'd done something differently? I'm curious, or had responded differently to your daughter? I think, I'm super proud of her now. Sure. I, um, sorry, thank you. I actually called her last night and said, did I ever make you think about the way you looked, or did I ask oh. you what you wanted to do? <laughs> <laughs> so we had that discussion. <laughs> Um, but I think it's more maybe our perceptions as parents, like uh -huh. it's one thing to say how do we face fear, physical fear ourselves, versus how do we encourage our daughters yeah. at that very difficult age that it's okay and I'm not going to consider you a wild child, this is just mm -hmm. you trying to figure out where you fit in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know, as, so I don't regret it, mm -hmm. it's more just maybe catching a self-perception, mm -hmm. or, or excuse me, catching a perception that I had that I didn't know I had of her. Mm -hmm. and, and how do we encourage that in the schools mm -hmm. as well? Mm -hmm. that, that is wonderful. And, and I think that's, you know, that's, like I said, I'm still working that, on that as a teacher, catching myself doing things that are really, really subtle that I don't intend to limit young ladies, but it, but it does, and, and young boys too. You know, it's really, can I, I just admit that I thought it's one story, and, and that is um, when, I, uh, when I graduated from, I grew up with four brothers, and I think I learned a lot by watching my brothers and how my parents treated my brothers, and they were really encouraged to do anything and everything. And I was too, to some extent, partly just from growing up in that environment, but I was also really encouraged that what I needed to do was grow up and be a dental hygienist because it's a great backup job for a, a woman who's going to get married, but if you ever lose your husband, you can kind of work part-time as a dental <laughs> hygienist. <laughs> With no, no inkling that I probably wouldn't ever want to really stick my hands in other people's mouths for a living. <laughs> So that was kind of early on, and then I remember, and, and again, I love my parents dearly, but these were the times that I grew up in. And um, I remember when I was going off to college, I loved science, and I was going off to college to study science, and I remember my dad kind of jokingly say, gosh, I've got four sons, and it's my daughter that's going into science. You know, and those are, and I kind of thought, hmm, those are, they're, they're really subtle, but, but they are, I don't think they're intended. They want to build you up as a kid, but I don't think people really understand the consequences. And then when I graduated, I went off. Louder? Yeah. I'm sorry. How about if I do that? Is that better? Can you hear okay? Maybe, and maybe we can turn the sound up on both of us. That's okay. So when I graduated from uh, college, I traveled through Ecuador, and I had been planning this for, through South America, excuse me, and I had been planning this for a couple years, and I, and I let my folks know, I let friends know, I said, anybody want to go with me, because um, I didn't really want to go by myself, and I found uh, one of my friends um, to go with me, and when I told my parents that the plans were in place and I was going to do this, my dad said, no you're not. You're not going to South America with Dave. <laughs> and, and I said, Dad, it's no big, you know, he's just a friend. And I was actually really surprised at this point. It was my mom who said, of course she's going. That's something she can do. And I was actually shocked that my mom would say that. Of course, she was really pleased that when we stopped at my parents' house, 
before we started that trip that Dave was sewing sequins on his pants. <laughs> Somebody, I see you standing with the, you, yeah. All right, thank you. Sure. My question is about um, teaching practices and what you've seen in the classroom when you get all female students and if there are bigger risk takers when there are no boys in the room versus when you have a mixed um, student base and if you've had that experience and if not if you think that female students would be bigger risk takers in that situation. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. You know, I've not had that personal experience myself. Can, can you hear me okay? Just so not so good? <laughs> Hello? Hello. Yeah. Hello. Uh, just, for, just for one second, I did go to a girls' school, and I actually went to a girls' school with Sally Ride, who was a very uh, close friend because it was a small school. Okay. Talk into the mic. Um, there you go. Small things in this life. I needed you on my shuttle. <laughs> I wouldn't have remembered anything. Um, I loved it. And I, you know, I'm not big on segregation of any kind, but I have to say being in high school with girls only was fantastic. I mean, it was freewheeling. We comp one of the things I loved about it is we learned to compete really hard with women who were our best friends. And I always thought that was so healthy. And then at the end, after you compete, and you know, be it in sports or for the, you know, a presidency of the student body or something, then you still were pals. Um, with no distractions. So, you know, I, I can't say it, it, it didn't, wasn't the making necessarily of Sally Ride because we have an example of somebody who didn't go to a girls only school. But I, I think to preserve a voice through that period, which is, it was invaluable to me. Thanks so much, Ann. I was just thinking about uh, something that happened this summer. We were working with a group of junior high students who were, pr who were learning how to code. So they were learning how to do C++ programming. These are, these are middle and high school, middle and junior high students, excuse me, um, to be able to pr uh, actually move these uh, uh, experimental satellites, these robots on the International Space Station. Wonderful program. We had boys and girls. We had about 25. It was a pilot program. And there were about six, six girls in the group. And um, when it came time to dividing up into small groups to do the programming, one of the teachers that I was working with kind of evenly distributed everybody, and the girls were put into, they were separated out, and there was a girl in each group. And I watched as we, the the, these teams were kind of standing around the room, and I saw the girls' faces, and some of them literally, and it wasn't just their faces, it was their whole body language. A few of them seemed to just melt back into the wall, and you could just see, you know, this kind of behavior and action. And so I kind of pulled the teacher aside and said, hey, what do you think about this? Can I just talk to these girls for a few minutes? And so I took them out in the hall, and ask, what do you guys think? What do you what do you want to do? I can kind of see, you know, some of you are are showing that you're not really thrilled about being in a team with the guys. And I knew what would happen is if that's how they were feeling, the guys would do all the work, the girls wouldn't do anything, and they wouldn't learn anything. And so um, it was very interesting. Two of them said, no, they were just fine. They didn't care. And and uh, four of them wanted to be in a group together. And so that's exactly what we did, and those, and all of them were very successful because of that. I don't think they would have been if, had we left them in their groups the way that the teachers had planned for it. Does that work there? Uh, about physical risks, I, I find, uh, you know, I'm 54 years old. I took up weightlifting three years ago. I think I touched on at least seven of your points, and of not being afraid to make a fool out of myself. But you know, I look back at, at how I've transformed physically from um, being active, being not necessarily in sports per se, but having a level of fitness that gave me confidence is something I've really found in my 50s. And I look at young women today 
well, I'll say women of all ages, with all the different roles that we have every day, to find time for ourselves, to what I call to find our own strength, physical strength, um, just to get through to, um, you know, I, I talked to some folks, I lost a dear friend this summer, and I think all of my workouts were so I could spend her last night holding her hand. Um, it's that physical strength, that confidence, I think, that may hold us back from taking those risks. And I was just wondering about your observations on that. How we're kind of the weaker sexes we're kind of ta talked about um, in how actually getting fit and being healthy can really give you that other confidence to take those risks. How about for the rest of you? What do you, what do you all think? Does that make a difference? Yeah, I, I, I know personally for me it does. And Anne? I mean, yeah, I think it's invaluable, and I think it's, it's great. You know, it's funny because I know a lot of women. I, I just retook up beach volleyball, <laughs> which is going to be the day, which is lovely because then you could get a face full of sand. The, the good thing about taking up beach volleyball at quite an advanced age is that you're not going to break anything when you fall, but you have that glorious sensation of being able to fall, which is really fun. Um, but I think a lot of women I know are, are doing things now that they didn't do before um, as an affirmation of a way to age and an affirmation of a way to feel joyous and, you know, happy in their bodies and all of that kind of stuff. Just one pivot point about the physical risk part, because you so smartly pointed out, one of the things that we can tend to do is accord too much um, um, approbation to physical risk, when in fact a lot of the risks that women take are not physical and, they're, and therefore often not seen as risk. Um, and I, I just think that a more holistic, to use a word I really don't like, um, view of what risk is and how in fact women take it, I mean, on so many levels, on so many ways, in so many days, um, be it, you know, I don't know, marrying the right person, divorcing, you know, starting a new career, that's all very risky stuff and I'm not sure that we applaud ourselves for that sense of riskiness because the culture tends to stamp physical risk as, as what's risky. Well put. Well, there we go. Back to the lady with the boy and the girl and the risk. I wonder if some of that is about safety. You know, we as parents, our job is to keep our children safe. And that's a very good thing when they're this age. But we still want to keep them safe when they're this age. And little girls tend to make a big deal when they fall. I mean, you know, so you feel kind of guilty as a parent for letting that happen. Where little boys, if they do it one time, they don't do it again because they're told little boys don't cry. So I think that maybe plays into it a bigger than we give credit for, speaking of a mental risk. No, I do think that's true. I do, I've, you know, mothers, the tendency is to swoop up a little girl and, and cuddle and, and thing, and the, and the boy, you say immediately, be a little man or man up. <laughs> maybe, we need to say, maybe we need to say woman up. Not maybe, we need to. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so what I have to say is kind of goes off of that to a degree. Um, so we teach uh, little girls from a very young age, even and then uh, women throughout their life, that uh, to be safe, to, uh, so not to risk themselves physically, emotionally, and psychologically because of the high numbers of sexual assault that women go through. Um, so what we need to stop doing, I feel, is telling little girls uh, to not go out at night, that we have to carry weapons just to feel safe, that we have to depend on men in order to be safe, and start talking to boys and men about how they can um, not attack women and keep women safe. Great point. I have two questions or two statements. First of all, thank you. I was, I was a student uh, of Mrs. Morgan in the second and the fourth grade. So, the, so, uh, 
Commander Stephanie Shepard. She's fabulous. <laughs> so, so thank you for teaching me uh, that really a thousand pounds of feathers and a thousand pounds of coal is in fact the same thing. I didn't teach you anything. You came with all that. You were fantastic. <laughs> It has stuck with me. And I will tell you that, that graduating from McCall Donnelly High School at the time that you were going through the Teacher in Space program and, and, and watching you go through that, from my experience, uh, watching you do that, a teacher from McCall uh, taught me a sense of, of risk, uh, both the physical and it's like, I, I didn't think that I could ever be in the military and I thought, well, Mrs. Morgan could, could be in space. So, <laughs> so you taught that. Thanks by doing, and I thank you. You were supposed to be a, see a teacher and want to be a teacher, but I'm really proud of you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Steph. You know, I think one of the things that's really helpful is to see, you know, real life astronauts up close and personal. I mean, I do think, I know in my brain, I still think people who take great physical risk women are a breed apart. I, I do, and I think that that's, I shouldn't think that. <laughs> I mean, here you are, living, breathing, looking. But, but I think we do that. I think for women, we say, oh, well, she's a you know, super jock, or she's a this or that, as opposed to thinking that's just a really terrific woman who made a you know, big decision, and you know, I could make a comparable one. Not for me going in space. That's just not happening. But, but something, something that, that implies um, that sort of risk, I think, is, I think it's good. So I think the risk of deciding early on that you wanted to be independent in your work and you knew what you wanted to do and going for it, I think it's exactly the same thing. It really is. It really is. Especially in those days, too. So you can't, can't get away with it. <laughs> Okay, having been raised and being labeled the difficult child and the risk taker, and even as an adult, I've had, you know, my parents ask me, why won't I stay home and be a real mom? And my in-laws say, you know, why do you need to go to school? And that kind of stuff. I kind of understand uh, where this is all coming from, but, and, you know, I went on to, I did 12 years in the military. I've been a wildland firefighter, and it's just improved my life greatly to be labeled that difficult child and to know that I can take those risks. But my question is, how do we break that cycle? How do we teach our daughters that it's okay to let their daughters be risk takers and to, you know, let them fall and let them meet the challenges and not label them so as a negative thing? How do we, how do we teach our daughters that that's okay? So I would love to hear Anne's and anybody else's answer on this too, but for me, it's the same as in the classroom, one child at a time. And it all starts with us. And I think if we can all make that commitment to keep working on it, eventually you get a critical mass. I love the word critical mass because it seems to move things forward. But it, it has to start with one person at a time. I do think that what um, the woman said before is really an important piece of this, that we, we I mean, in the back of our minds as women, and certainly as mothers, is always the fear of sexual assault. I don't care what age, you know, that is a fear that we carry, and we certainly carry it for our daughters. And unless we hit that front on, we are going to be transmitting some protective fear to girls. And I, you know, I appreciate the thought that, you know, which was said, I think, in the previous um, session, too, you know, that the consciousness raising has to be among young men and, you know, with, with groups or whatever, how we hit that. Because I do think it's something that, you know, when we talk about risk, if we don't talk about that, that's the big elephant in the room, because that's what you fear for a girl. I mean, you know, you've, you, or a daughter. So if you've got a wild child or somebody who's doing stuff and, you know, I don't know what, what permutations your wild childness took, but if girls start to act out in ways that, that mothers think are gonna put them at sexual risk, that gets scary. That's where even the most, I think, liberated of us who want our daughters to do everything, fly everything, be everything, pull up. And I don't know what the answer to that is, except obviously a lot more. Yes, my sweet. <laughs> Stand up. Can you hear that? Women who have been the victims of any kind of sexual assault in this room, stand up. Uh, 
uh, on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, they think it's something like nine and 10 girls by the time they reach the age of 20. Um, some parts of our culture, it's certainly worse. Uh, in South Africa, probably every woman in this room uh, would have stood up, but thank you for having the courage to do that. So, thank you, Alexandra, for, for asking that really important question, and thank you for those of you for having the courage to stand up. I, was, I have not been sexually assaulted, but I think a lot of this, so I'm gonna go back to, Anne, what you were saying, what the uh, folks back there were saying about how we raise, yes, it's important how we raise our boys, but how we raise our daughters, because I think so much of it has to, not all of it, but I think some of it has to do with some confidence too. And I remember when I was a little girl, for some reason, I would find myself in these situations three or four times where, um, where there was, um, and I'm gonna forget the name right now, but when, when a stranger comes up and exposes himself to you. And does that happen to folks here? Because that happened to me, yeah, that happens a lot. And it was very bizarre. And the first time I thought, what, you know? <laughs> And by the, th by the third time it happened, I remember uh, my, I was riding on a tandem bicycle with my youngest brother on the back seat and some car slowly pulls by and the guy says, look at me, look at me or whatever and shows us his stuff. Of course, my little brother's going. <laughs> and and I, I had seen it enough that I was angry at that point. And so I rode the bike as fast as I could. There happened to be a policeman standing uh, on on the next block on the you know with his motorcycle and I don't know what gave me the courage then because I was not a competent kid at all but I but I stopped and I said there's a crazy guy back there. there's a there's a crazy guy back there and um, that's all I could get out and then um, I rode on to the place where my brother and I were going and I called my dad and so my dad um, came and got me meanwhile he had found the cop the cop had stopped, wondered what's this girl talking about and had stopped the guy. And so my dad and I and my little brother were standing there with this man and he stood there and told us, you know, I would never do anything like that. I've got a wife and, and a daughter. And the, the cop had already d done a report on him and he'd been gotten in trouble before for being a peeping Tom. And I just looked at him and said, then, and this, I don't know why this popped out, but I guess because I was so angry, I said, then go do it to your wife and daughter. Why pick on us? You know, <laughs> but that was the first time I'd ever had that kind of confidence. Yet when I got to college and I found myself in some pretty dangerous situations with strangers that could have gotten really ugly really fast, I found myself frozen with fear. And I couldn't say, what are you, like, like the young woman who said, don't treat me like that, don't talk to me like that. I didn't have that kind of confidence then. So I think part of it, as we worry about our little girls and protect them, we're also transferring that, um, whatever that is that makes them not have the confidence to be able to stand up to tough situations. Does that make sense? I don't know. Yeah. I think there's somebody back, oh there, yeah. Do you need a microphone? You come get it. Is there? Do you have a microphone? Yes. No, can, wait, we'll get you one. And we'll we'll hit her first. Yeah. Okay. We'll be back. Yeah. I'm finding this whole conversation very interesting uh, from a personal and a professional standpoint. Uh, I work at uh, Idaho National Lab in the Human Factors Department and one of the domains that I spend a lot of my time in is risk analysis and quantifying uh, human contribution to risk in large technical systems. And it's a very physical focus on you know plant safety and personal safety. and that's a very different type of risk than, than some of the risks that we've been talking about, uh, you know, personal risk, uh, uh, psychological risk, societal risk, you know, taking chances. And 
it's interesting that working in the area of risk analysis has made me a little more risk averse. And at INL recently, we just decided we were going to start a women's employee resource group. And I was all excited to get involved in that, and we came to the time of, all right, we're going to now see, we need officers, we need people to lead this group. And it was the scariest thing for me to say, yes, I'll do that. And when I look back at my life, I, I think, look at the times when I was in high school and junior high, and those risk, those risk that I took would get slammed down, and I would have, you know, people retaliate for taking chances um, and stepping out. And so I wanted to kind of just raise the issue of, or, or ask for people's opinions about, well, what can we do? Well, one is adults who've grown up with these uh, pressures to uh, not take chances. How do you then muster up the courage to start taking chances? And then how do we start, um, you know, addressing it, these things in high school and junior high and, and elementary school when you see girls taking chances and then get punished for it. You know, it, it's, a, it's a really very uh, challenging, complex issue that sometimes I think those types of societal taking, risk taking is scarier and more dangerous uh, from a psychological perspective than just taking physical risks and being a tomboy uh, and, you know, ch climbing trees and climbing rocks and skydiving. I, I agree with you, and I, I think that's one of the reasons, uh, so I'm embarrassed because this is not about me, but I, I'm going to bring up the space program. One of the reasons I think um, that it was so important that, um, that after Challenger and then again after Columbia that we didn't retreat, that we kept moving forward, is it seems like this whole country has gotten more risk averse. Okay, and to me it was really important that we do everything we can to push forward. Again, it kind of going back to the very beginning, if we don't risk anything, we're not going anywhere, we're not gonna learn. I don't, we, yes, we, we have our token mail. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about taking risks, Barbara. <laughs> Thank you, Alan, we are very much appreciated. <laughs> Um, the question I have is, um, uh, if, you, if you look at who has the greatest influence on children in our country, uh, outside of the family, it's the school teachers in the schools. And 80% or probably more of the teachers in the public school system, or in the school system in general, are women. And I'm wondering, is there a role in our colleges of education, and you and I have discussed subjects along this line at various times, is there a role in the colleges of education when, they, when teachers are being trained to be able to address this subject that we're discussing here for the last three days and make teachers aware that they are the ones that have the greatest influence? Now, I can get on into many, many other areas along this line, such as the respect our society is giving to teachers today, and is this the meaning, really one of the great places where women can have an influence and they're not getting the respect they are, and then you look at the number one uh, country in the world, Finland, where it takes the most unique teachers to be, unique students to be able to get into the teaching profession and they have great respect starting there. So it's just a subject that uh, you know you and I have bounced around a little bit, and a subject that I think would be very interesting for colleges of education to start taking a look at. Absolutely, I'll give them one. Yeah, absolutely. You know what I thought? One of the other interesting things I have my youngest stepson, who's oh, 50, went back to school. He'd always wanted to teach in third grade. And he went back to school and got a degree in Sacramento, and he was the only kid in his, you know, male in his program destined to go into a classroom of, you know, kids right at the age where you, it would be lovely to have a male saying to the guys and to the, you know, don't, don't hog everything and to the girls speak up, which is what he's trying to do. So just to say, there are lovely young men being put forth on this earth. 
And there's reverse discrimination there too. I've got several friends who were males who were teaching kindergarten and they are fabulous teachers. You would want your kid and your grandchild and your great-grandchild in those classrooms, but they, they, um, they're given a huge hassle for going into that grade level, and they really have to fight a battle to get there. It's where they want to be. They know they can affect the most change there, and it's tough for them. Okay, so say a few, she's going to say a few nice words about everybody risking everything before you're, <laughs> we're okay, done. Okay, so everybody, don't, don't risk everything because there are foolish risks, but weigh the pros, weigh the cons, go after the things. I, I hate telling people no, what to do. Funny. All right. Anyway, go after those things that are important to you and risk being the person who can make it happen and bring other people along with you. Thank you very much, and thank you so much, Anne.